Hello and welcome into this edition of the Golf Channel Podcast with Rex and Lav. There's no post-Augusta hangover for Scotty Scheffler as the now two-time Masters champion remained committed to the RBC Heritage site of this week's signature event on the PJ Tour. Rex, you just got out of Scotty's press conference. Scotty isn't hungover despite the late night uh, dive bar that he went to in Dallas on Sunday evening. But are you following the 88th Masters? Uh, not hungover, but certainly tired. I mean, last week takes a lot out of you. It was funny hearing Scotty talk about that that pub that they ended up going to. They were there for 20 minutes, and they had a designated driver. They, his wife, Meredith, was their driver. So, yeah, that's as, that's as wild and crazy, I guess, as Scotty Scheffler gets his 20 minutes in a pub after winning the green jacket. But it's it's interesting talking with him because of how much more comfortable he seems in his own skin this time around versus last time around. And I think last time around probably took an enormous toll on him it, i'm sure physical toll it took as well this time it seems like he was able to enjoy it a little bit more and he, he we can get into he sort of touched on the idea that he, the the neck injury that's kind of started to pop up from time to time popped up sunday morning he said it was kind of a stressful warm-up but he said his heart rate went down as soon as he got to the first tee it's kind of counterintuitive to what we hear a lot of times for guys who show up at the first tee with a chance to win the masters and i think it shows you the evolution of Scotty as a player, like he's so much more relaxed. He's so much more confident in what he does. And uh, I wrote this yesterday and, and I, I, I wrestled with this for the entire drive from Augusta all the way over to Hilton Head. I mean, I don't want to compare him to, to Tiger Woods, but what he's doing is Tiger-esque. Hmm. Certainly interesting. We're going to chew on that in a little bit. Wow, way well to dig his, in on that one. As, hell, as well as his decision to remain committed to the RBC Heritage. Uh, I, will, I, for one, thought, all right, you just won your master's. Go ahead and take two or three weeks off. Uh, be at home with your pregnant wife, Meredith, who's due at the end of the month with the couple's first child and prepare for the PGA Championship. We'll get his decision to play Harbor Town. But Rex, first, there was some news I wanted to get into on Tuesday on the Roy McElroy front. If you're living under a rock, you probably missed this. But a London-based financial newspaper reported on Monday that Roy was close to signing a mega deal with Live Golf about $850 million. But in an interview with Golf Channel's Todd Lewis on Tuesday, Rory strongly denied it. In fact, he said that he and his team have never had a conversation about joining Liv. He and his team have never gotten an offer from the Saudi back league. And most critically, I thought Rex, Roy McRae said he will play on the PGA Tour for the remainder of his career. What do you think all this was about? Uh, first off, I hate giving these types of reports any kind of legs at all like i hate these unsubstantiated reports that we have to go chase after players players have to make comments about it but that's sort of the real reality that we live in in this particular case you and i both had kind of seen it as soon as sort of i think the first report started coming out late sunday maybe early monday morning and i don't know about you but i was getting tons and tons of text messages from just all of my friends everyone <laughs> who wanted to know if it was real so yes that's why we have to tackle those reports because journalistically i feel like it's kind of reckless to follow up on this it's no sourcing it's completely unsubstanti unsubstantiated uh I, I will give rory credit he had he had decided he wasn't going to do any media at all this week he didn't have a pre-tournament press conference he wasn't scheduled to have a, any kind of interview with todd lewis or the golf channel and that all changed because of those reports and he showed up about noon yesterday and he shot them down i, I will say it's kind of twofold here and it, it's worth pointing out that yesterday the policy board or the board of directors for PGA Tour Enterprises met here in Hilton Head. And there was, a, there was some, some things that kind of came out of that, but that we can touch on. The timing of it is interesting. And I'm not saying anyone is using this as leverage, but if you were the other side, I'm talking about the PIF side, the live side, that would be some brilliant leverage, it, whether if it's true or not, to bring Rory's name into the mix as a possible, as the next shoe to drop. We all know how impactful it was last year when John Rahm left to go to live golf imagine the leverage they would get from rory and i don't think this is going to be a one-off i mean i would guess that this is going to kind of be how things this is going to be how things work going forward until we in, either come up with a deal or we move forward in two separate directions because at, at this point you're just sort of waiting for whatever is going to come next it, it is interesting because it isn't just roy's name that has been thrown out even the guardian and our friend Ewan Murray was reporting that Liv is targeting Victor Hovland, the reigning FedEx Cup champion, uh, as their next 
big target. That also it seems incredibly unlikely at the moment, but certainly as we saw with John Rahm in December, stranger things have happened. The way that the, the Rory mega deal was, was spun, I found very interesting because on its surface, it didn't seem totally far-fetched. Here's a player who Roy McIlroy said that he felt like a sacrificial lamb post June 6 of last summer. He'd step back from the PGA Tour policy board. He's clearly at odds with like this Patrick Cantlay, Jordan Spieth, Tiger Woods faction. He has expressed uh, discontentment, disconcertment with the slow progress of a potential deal between the PGA Tour and the Saudi Public Investment Fund, saying that the re reunification uh, of any sort of deal should be the top priority, and the sooner that gets done, uh, the better. But, but if you operate under the assumption that Liv will eventually be folded into the tour and Rory can be like an owner of sort of a marketable franchise one day, sure, I guess that sort of makes sense. But the PR blowback would be immense. And I'm glad that Rory, at least on April 16th, 2024, not necessarily pledging his, his fealty to the PGA Tour, but I mean, this is like fealty on steroids. He, he is he's essentially saying he will never join Live Golf and he will continue to play on the PGA Tour for the remainder of his career. Keep in mind, he turns 35 uh, next month. And there's kind of two important distinctions to point out here. One, Rory told Todd Lewis after that report off camera that he's had numerous conversations with Yassir, the, the governor, Yassir al and the governor of the uh, Saudi Arabian Public Investment Fund. And he said he's made his thoughts clear on not joining Live Golf, that it's just not for me. And Rory's take was that's probably why we've never had the conversation about, hey, if you were interested, what would it be? Like, give me a number that it would cost to bring you into the fold. That was kind of his take on that front. The, the other half of this equation, and the, we had I had a lot of conversations about that this uh, yesterday morning before Rory actually spoke. I understood this as a possibility, to your point, that it wasn't far-fetched. I understood it from Rory's standpoint. He has, according to that report, 850 million reasons <laughs> to be interested in this particular deal, if that's, a, in, in fact, what he would be offered in this case. From the public investment fund's perspective, though, is where I didn't understand it. You go back to last year. John Rahm was the ultimate leverage play. It, in a very, very important part of the negotiations, you went and stole probably arguably one of the top two or three most important pieces of the PGA Tour right out from under him. The person that they expected to be to be loyal, he, his fealty, everything else about it. To do it this time, I just think would be overkill. It's probably unnecessary. Like no one really knows where the negotiations are at this point. It's clear that there is progress being made on some front. And to do it at this point, I feel like one, it's not necessary, that it's clear that the public investment fund still has the upper hand and the negotiations. And two, it's probably not gonna be constructive. If you're trying to bring the two sides together, continually to, to, <laughs> to steal their talent, it's probably not the best way to build, build that trust across the table. Yeah, I mean, you'd, you'd essentially be forcing the PJ Tour surrender. Essentially, if you take Roy McIlroy, the number one star uh, on the PGA Tour non-Tiger Woods division, who seemingly uh, can only play in the major championships uh, moving forward, Rory is the headliner of the PGA Tour and taking him for whatever amount of money would, would, would most certainly force the PGA Tour to surrender and sort of make a deal uh, under less than ideal circumstances. I'm with you. I think it'd be overkill as well. And I can't help but think, Rex, what would John Rahm's reaction would have been to seeing this. John Rahm, uh, the, the reported figure was at least $300 million. All of a sudden, Rory, who is five or six years older, uh, has not won a major championship since John Rahm burst on the scene, who has now uh, won two. All of a sudden, he is worth $850 million, and John Rahm was just worth uh, only $300 million. Would love to see his reaction yeah, right? when that you, came you okay across there? the bulletin. That's enough on Rex on, on that Rex. Uh, Scotty Scheffler just got out of the press conference. I thought it was very interesting when Scotty referenced a interview he just did with Colt Nost uh, on Sirius XM, where Colt essentially asked him, like, hey man, why why are you even play in Harbor Town? Like you've just won three of your last four starts. You've lost to one golfer total since the beginning of March. Your your wife is pregnant and at home. You got the PJ championship on deck in a month's time. What was his answer and why was that striking to you? Uh, I am surprised. I, I get where Colt was coming from. He made a commitment. I mean, I don't think any of us should be surprised by that. I think we know enough about Scotty Scheffler now as a collective society to be like, yeah, if, if that dude says he's going to do something more times than not, he's probably going to do that thing. So I get it from that perspective. He did actually kind of shed some light, and he said he actually kind of regretted 
talking about where Meredith was in the pregnancy and the idea that he would leave the Masters if he was in contention. His take was he felt like that had gotten blown out of proportion. Hmm. I did not get the impression that she's close. Uh, I don't think there's any indication that not only was she not going to give birth last week, he's clearly as comfortable that he, thinking that she's not going to, to do it this week. That's why he's here. And I think the fact of the matter is when you laid out that schedule, I think everybody sort of understood what the ebb and flow of the season was going to be. And he understands he's done this before. This was a designated event last year after he won. He understands that, that look, I'm going to be tired. I'm going to have to summon some sort of energy reserves after last week. But it's not like he's never done this before. So as much as we're probably were a little surprised that he decided to keep his commitment to this tournament, I think in his mind there was no other option. Yeah, I, I agree with you. It didn't quite feel like, remember the 2015 uh, RBC Heritage where Jordan Spieth had just won the Masters. He's the biggest star uh, in, in all of golf, if not sports. And then he he maintains that commitment. Everyone applauds him for maintaining that commitment. This this to me was not that. Where Scotty Scheffler obviously is, is tired. Uh, he's going to be uh, sort of prioritizing rest for the remaining uh, four days. But he's also playing the best golf of his life. And there was no reason not to tee it up, he said, if he did not think that he could win. He said he has every reason to be at home. Pregnant wife, uh, he can gloat in his victory. They celebrated Sunday night. They celebrated Monday night. Uh, he could certainly take the remaining uh, few weeks off before the PGA Championship. I, I think he just wants to continue the hot streak. I think he wants to see just how good he can possibly be and whether he can keep this going. Again, he has lost to a total of one golfer since the beginning of March. It was Steven Yeager at the Houston Open when Scotty Scheffler lipped out a four-foot putt in the 72nd hole that would have forced a playoff. This is the best run, according to Data Golf, that we have seen since Tiger Woods' is prime. From a, a strokes gain perspective, he is beating the competition. He is head and shoulders above the competition so much. We have not seen this in more than 20 years. Uh, I think expectations should certainly be lowered uh, for Scotty Scheffler. I don't think in any way this run will be diminished if he somehow finishes 45th. And what is a limited field, no cut start. Uh, but I also don't think he would necessarily be the favorite teeing it up this week. Do you agree or disagree with that? I agree. And I think there's probably something to be said for the idea that this golf course, this particular golf course, requires a certain skill set. And he has that skill set. Let's be honest. It's a ball strikers golf course. You have to hit the ball where you're looking. And as he proved last week, as he's proved really the last few weeks, no one's doing that better right now than him. So there's part of him that is probably excited about playing here this week. Because if I'm playing so well, I can win at these other venues. Imagine what I can do at Harbortown, where the one thing I do better than anyone else is so important. I, I, I do want to point out the idea that as exhausting as it was, he went home Sunday night, got in late, understandably so, but I think he flew in this morning, Wednesday morning. So it's not as though he had some time home. He had some, some. Uh, he had the ability to sort of unwind a little bit. So I, I think he's probably going to be in a good headspace. I do think... And I don't want to set off alarm bells here. But the more and more we hear about the neck was hurting Sunday morning, I do think that's something that we probably need to pay a little bit more attention to. Yeah, if it crops up at the Players' Championship, crops up again on Sunday morning uh, at Augusta National, he can say it's stress-related, but this is obviously a continuation of what bothered him uh, a month ago. Uh, I'm, I'm with you. I think it's uh, something worth looking at. But also, he's about to have a couple weeks off. And I don't think it's anything huge to worry about before Valhalla. One quick thing, Rex. We got the ratings for CBS and Master Sunday. And I think everyone was surprised to see that the final round ratings were down 20%. Just about nine and a half uh, folks tuned in for the final round of the Masters. What's your read on that? Any possible explanation in his golf in a world of hurt? Uh as I'm wont to do on this podcast, I'm going to pull back the curtain a little bit and we're not supposed to talk about ratings. So I do appreciate you continually bringing them up. So it's just so we can poke the bear. Let's say, let's, let's see no, how sir. far we, let's see how far we can push this, I guess is what we're going to do here. Um, it, it is interesting because you look at what the weight ratings were last week on Thursday and Friday. I think Friday was up 70% thereabouts, which is a, a pretty good number year over year. And uh, talking with people here at Hilton Head kind of about it, because it is it is something that's being talked about on the range in your defense. Like it's it's a, it's a topic in golf that needs to be addressed. Uh, I'm curious how much of that Thursday and Friday was the Tiger effect 
because there was elements of Tiger. He played 23 holes on Friday because of the delays. Uh, he he played the, in the majority of the of the of the network window. He played Thursday. late. He played late Thursday, and the, yeah. and the coverage went about an hour later than was scheduled because of the delay. And then because of the 23 holes on Friday, he was also in that main window for a good portion of that round. So I think that's always going to be a part of this, where there's a curiosity still when it comes to Tiger Woods. I I don't think you can dismiss the idea that Bryson DeChambeau played really, really well on Thursday. And we sort of had that dynamic that you and I addressed numerous times last week. Like you you need both sides of it. You you need the protagonist and the antagonist to make the thing work, to, to to create really interesting, compelling content. And you had that for a day or two before I think Bryson started to fade. And I mean, if I had to guess on on Sunday, it's twofold. One, Tiger Woods was so utterly out of the mix that he, he wasn't in the window. Like it really wasn't even something that we talked about very often. And I just think Tiger has gotten to the point, and this is going to predate you, but it's Mike Tyson when he was at his best. Like it got to the point where Mike was knocking people out so quickly going in into prize fights that no one wanted to watch him. Like, I'm not going to pay a hundred dollars to, to watch this on pay-per-view. If I'm going to get 10 seconds of content, uh, I, I think there is an element to that as well. I, I think there's certainly some competing factors. When you look at kind of year of year, last year was master Sunday. That's essentially a stay at home holiday. And that could have boosted viewership. Uh, I do think there's something to be said, although I'm not sure it's quantifiable that this PJ tour live divide has, has harmed golf in some way. I don't know whether it's significant. I don't know whether that equates to 4 million viewers uh, or not, but I do think people have been turned off by, by the rhetoric and by the dialogue that we've had in the sport uh, over the past couple of years. You mentioned the tiger factor and, and not being in contention. I just think that golf in general is sort of due for this market correction where it was, it was carried by tiger woods for so long, 15, 20 years. And now it's sort of reverting uh, to what it was uh, pre tiger. And I, and I think that's that's totally fine. It's just when you're paying for the media rights deals uh, and you're expecting a product and you don't get it, that, that's where you have uh, some potential headaches. I don't think this is necessarily an indictment of Scotty Scheffler uh, and not being sort of a marketable superstar. I don't think this is an indictment of the actual final round. Like you and I were out on the golf course. I thought it was I thought it was phenomenal. It was it was a tie ball game with eleven holes to play. You know, for at least more than half of the Masters final round, it was as good as it can possibly get with several top 10 players in the world with a player we have not seen uh, since Tiger Woods' prime uh, in the mix. Uh, so I don't think it's necessarily that. I think there's I think there's a confluence of events, uh, but it is interesting, especially against the backdrop. You were there uh, with Roy McIlroy talking about the ratings, uh, PGA Tour events, and the major championships. He thought that the Masters would be a barometer. And if Masters ratings were down, uh, he thought that that would sort of be a signal uh, that the sport that uh, could be in trouble. I think it's. I think it's important to be uh, viewed against that as well. Yeah, let's uh, by all means let's keep talking about ratings because this is going to do nothing but get us in trouble. Um, I, to your point, they were up Thursday, Friday, and so I do think the Masters is a, a bit of a standalone, which is, was kind of Rory's point. I think that probably the bigger litmus test will be next month at the PGA Championship and certainly the U.S. Open. You get a better barometer, uh, but. Rory talked about this even yesterday when Todd Lewis spoke to him about the idea that the path that the game is on right now is not sustainable for these reasons. And it's also worth pointing out, and I had this conversation with a bunch of people over the last two days here in Hilton Head, the actual state of the game is very, very good. You and I both know it. You had to join a club in North Florida because you couldn't find a tee time any other way. Golf courses in Orlando are constantly packed. You and I walked the grounds last week at the Masters. We walked the grounds at, at the Players' Championship there was no shortage of fans of excitement of people who wanted to be a part of this. We know that rounds are up year over year, that the game is still very, very popular, that popularity that it sort of tapped into during the COVID pandemic continues, whether if that was of golf making or, or something else, like they were able to leverage that and make the most of it. The only thing that seems to be in trouble right now is pro golf. And so I do think when we conflate, you know, we have a tendency of conflating this, that we have a, there's a problem in golf. I don't believe that to be true. There's a problem at the highest levels of golf, professional golf. And I, that I'm not smart enough to pretend I know exactly what the fix is, but we can both agree that unification is probably the only path forward. It is funny too, like the cyclical nature of this, where the recreational game and club manufacturers were trying to latch on to the Tiger Woods wave through the 2000s and the early 2010s. Now it's the exact opposite, where the elite professional game is trying to grab hold of this wave that we've seen on the recreational standpoint. And that's why you see the PJ Tour and Live Golf and the spawning of that 
sort of adopting alternative formats. You have the TGL League, all these things to try and uh, appeal to younger gener- uh, younger demographic, the under- younger generation that is not doing things that we saw uh, 20, 30 years ago. It's just interesting, uh, the cyclical nature of that. Uh, and I'm sure we'll be hearing more about this in the future. Men's major championship was last week. Women's major championship, Rex, is this week with the Chevron championship. Nelly Corda, uh, the top-ranked player in the world, going for five in a row in her second major championship. It's a very interesting dis- uh, discussion that was unfolding during the pre-tournament press conferences. I'm going to put you on the spot, uh, which is always one of my favorite things to do. But the question that arose was, does Nelly Corda have a responsibility to carry the flag now for the LPGA? Nelly Corda, uh, to her credit, said no, and that she is just – wanting to promote it basically the way that she is. She's never going to do something that she's uncomfortable with. Stacy Lewis, however, came in a short while afterward. Stacy Lewis, who has been the world number one, uh, she has been the top-ranked American player. She says yes, <laughs> that Nelly Corda does have a responsibility. The best thing she can do, of course, is playing great golf. This is the best golf we've seen from an American since 1978. But it's also saying yes to other things. It's doing as much extra stuff as you possibly can. It's pushing TV partners to help uh, with with more coverage. Every week, it's giving press conferences. It's, every week, it's giving the media a couple hours a week. Where do you fall on this? Because it doesn't seem like for what Nelly Corda is accomplishing that it has resonated far and wide quite yet. I think this goes to, and I'm trying to remember the name, and I'm going to get added on this one. I, I know I am. But the, the star player for uh, the UConn team, the one that um, won the national championship, uh, I can't think of it. Diana Tarazi? No, no, no. The, the, the star player right now. Paige Bruckers, whatever. Yes, thank I, you. I think that's how you pronounce it. I think she was asked about now that Caitlin Clark has moved on to the WNBA, does she feel the responsibility to sort of take up the reins and be the, the face and, and the voice of women's basketball, women's collegiate basketball? And her answer w- falls in line with what I think you're asking. Her answer was no. It's not my responsibility. It's all of our responsibility that we should all want to be the face and the voice uh, of college basketball. And in this particular case, and I, I haven't spent like full disclosure here. Neither one of us has spent a lot of time covering the women's game. My only the, my only interaction with the quarters was at the Olympics in Tokyo two years ago, and they were very reluctant of the limelight. They did not want to do interviews. They did them because that's the way the, the Olympics kind of works. But they didn't particularly enjoy the things that came along with winning the gold medal and everything else. So I don't think we just had our own world number one in the media center just a few minutes ago here at, in Harbor Town. He's not he's an electrical personality by any stretch of the imagination. We can all agree that, yeah, man, like he is the guy we want living next door. He's he's the guy we want to marry our daughter. Like he's the all American guy that's easy to like just because of the way he carries himself, the way he seems to stay true to himself, the way he commits to this event and comes to this event. It doesn't matter what happens Sunday at Augusta. This is a new week. But he's not the guy that embraces that role either. I think that was part of Tiger Woods's sort of what made him special back in his prime that not only was he exceeding all everyone's expectations and winning on a wildly regular basis but he was also grinding out all of the things that you just said that we need to see from Nelly Corda and I think it takes a really really special player to do that and and I'm not quite sure it's in her DNA to sort of be the face the voice of women's golf that's what I think the issue is is that any sort of aggressive marketing is against her DNA. It's against her personality. She comes off, at least in public settings, as shy, if not a little bit standoffish. She continues to be really close with her family and few others. It's not like she's a, a you know a, a charismatic presence uh, on the PGA Tour who is who is immensely popular among her peers as well. And I think that's why she stands kind of in stark contrast to a Caitlin Clark, who just completed her college career at Iowa and set all sorts of viewership records. Uh, concluding with a, uh, the college football or excuse me, college basketball national championship game just a couple of weeks ago. She was the most visible player in women's college basketball. She was doing constant press conferences. She let ESPN's Wright Thompson, the best feature writer uh, perhaps of, of our generation, tag along for more than six months for a piece that dropped uh, on the eve uh, of the Final Four. She just went on Saturday Night Live. She was part of the uh, WNBA draft rollout. She just had a, a press conference that was viewed by 50,000 people with her new WNBA team in Indiana. She's okay, you know, kind of getting all the smoke, getting all the attention, um, kind of kind of um, uh, marinating in all of the uh, limelight that she has received. That's not Nellie Corda's personality. 
But that is how you go if she was to seek that attention. That is how you go, to Stacey Lewis's point, how you go from a niche of a niche sport into a global superstar. It's visibility, it's accountability, it's accessibility, even if it's coming begrudgingly, which it, which it feels like if the, if the LPJ really wanted to force it on her or if her handlers wanted to force it on her, that's how it would be with Nellie Corda. But she didn't. I, I mean, we've seen it time and time again on the men's side. Um, ever since I began my career, Vijay Singh probably being the primary example. In his prime, not only was he world number one, not only was he winning a lot, he was doing it against Tiger Woods. Like that story is never going to get the full attention that it should because you can't come up, you can't conjure this story in a Hollywood writer's screen room because no one would believe it. I mean, he grew up in Fiji learning how to play golf in mud. And next thing you know, you're playing the, this generation's greatest player, toe-to-toe, head-to-head, winning major championships, becoming world number one, had zero interest in the spotlight, had zero interest in interacting with the press, had zero interest in capitalizing on whatever stardom should have come with all of that. That's the part that, that blows me away because because it was not in his DNA. Like That's not the way he's wired. You and I talk about it all the time. I love watching Cam Young hit golf balls. He's like a robot out there. I mean, it just makes a different sound. It's enjoyable for me to watch. Trying to interview Cam and Cameron Young is incredibly difficult because there's just not a lot of personality there. And if you, my wife was on this podcast right now, she would tell you that I don't have any personality. So I think it's important that to understand that people can't be something that they're not. You can try to shoehorn Nelly into this stardom role. You can try to pretend like you have to be the face and the voice. You need to you need to be the engine that makes everything work, but it's clearly not in her persona. The accomplishments, the attention, the accolades will come the better she continues to play golf. If she wins her second major championship this week, which will be five in a row, which is which no one has accomplished since Nancy Lopez in 1978, people will pay attention. Just as they paid attention the way Caitlin Clark was putting up 30, 35 points and draining threes from the logo. If you build it, they will come. And I, I do believe this is the year that they begin to come for Nelly Corda. Rex, real quick, non-Scotty Scheffler division. What else stands out to you this week at the RBC Heritage that you're interested in watching? Uh, the golf course. We talk about it all the time. This is one of the m- most enjoyable golf courses, uh, at least for me. Uh, of the entire year because it requires such a different skill set. Uh, skill set. Scotty was just talking about it that we talk all the time. And, and his it, the equation here, everybody say hi to Todd Lewis. Yes, he's getting ice cream. Yes, hi. I'm not gonna. You don't have a microphone, so you can't talk. I, I know it's hard for you not to talk, but you, you don't have a microphone. So you, no, thank you. He's, he's already looking. Ice. He's already looking forward to his guest appearance at the end of the year on the Golf Channel podcast with Rex and Laugh. Um, uh, Scotty talked about it. He had a he had a funny anecdote saying that at Augusta everything is so big. He pointed out the second hole, in the second green. It looks like it's just a massive complex, and he goes and everything here is so small. And he, it wasn't a knock at all. I think his argument was we talk about all the time how do you how do architects factor into the equation about players are hitting the ball too far? And he goes just look at what they've done here. And like that golf course is the perfect example of how you dial back power. You you dial, you force players who can hit it a mile to try something else, to try a three wood, to try an iron off a tee, because you're only going to put yourself into a really bad position trying to bomb your way around this golf course. That said, there's bombers that have won here. There's, there's guys who don't hit it far who've won here. Jordan Spieth, whoever, middle of the pack guy. Like It's pretty much everything one in between. So I would say, off the top of my head, you take the majors out of it. This is a, this is my one in the top five on tour for me, course-wise. Yeah, I love this uh, golf course. I love how the PG Tour has leaned into making their most interesting, perhaps most well-known venues a signature event with a $20 million purse. To me, that's the model. We go down the PGA Tour schedule, find those golf courses, find those venues that are most recognizable to fans and elevate them in ways. I think we saw that with, with Pebble Beach this year, which I thought was a big win, even though it got reduced to 54 holes. I think doing this for Harbor Town, I'd love to see it with Colonial, which I think is a super interesting venue on the PGA Tour. I know you're going to be there in a couple of weeks' time. I wish it were further removed from the Masters. I think there can be a potential letdown uh, here. Uh, you could see some fatigue uh, from the players. I would love to just see a week separation uh, before you do it, but that's how they set it up. I think the players also uh, like this, like the fact that it could be a working vacation. On the player standpoint, I'm curious to see how Jordan Spieth follows up a very surprising miscut uh, at Augusta National. I'm curious HB. to see whether Kyle Morikawa uh, can kind of build on what he accomplished playing in the final group 
on Sunday. Ludwig Oberg, his star has certainly risen, uh, giving his smashing debut last week at Augusta National. If I were to make a pick, we don't make pits because we are not gambling men, but this does feel like a Cam Young uh, victory week. He could finally pick up his first week, uh, first win on the PGA Tour, had another top 10 uh, at the Masters, five top 10s this year, good record at Harbortown, uh, despite being a bomber. Uh, he has this sort of uh, exactness and precision that you love to see. Before we get out of here, Rex, where are you eating this week in Hilton Head? Uh, a couple of places. Uh, Monday night, we have a tradition. I was with Andrew Bradley, our super producer. He and I played a couple holes of golf before you and I had to do the round table for the show that day. Uh, we and we, But we eat at this place. It's called Skull Creek. It's kind of a cafe on the other side of the island. And it, I've been doing it since my my kids and my family used to come up here for spring break. It's just a it's neat little low-key bar. Last night, we actually went to a barbecue place, which is right sort of outside the gates of Harbor Town. I believe that what's called – yeah, I'm going to mess it up. It was delicious, though. So barbecue last night, seafood uh, night before last. And so tonight will be uh, some sort of combination of those two, I hope. Wonderful. And you will be reporting for uh, Golf Channel and Golf Central, I believe, for the uh, next few days before heading back home to see Bunkmate and to celebrate your 25th wedding anniversary. That is going to do it for this edition of the Golf Channel Podcast with Rex and Lab. You guys know the drill. In the meantime, go to NBCSports.com slash golf for all the latest news, notes, and commentary, not just from the RBC Heritage, where Rex is for the la- for the next couple of days, but also from the Chevron Championship, where all of us writers will be pitching in with written content from the first women's major of the year. All right, we'll talk to you guys on Sunday night for a full recap of the RBC Heritage. In the meantime... Have a great rest of your week.